and say uh, who we are. Um, Melissa Blair, I teach history at UMBC. Jerry Green, I am a trustee at Pleasant View Historic Site, and um, we have a partnership with the students in the public history class at UMBC. Oh, great. Yes. Gina Lewis, I teach art at Bowie State University, but I do interdisciplinary projects that merge public history, public humanities, and art research methodology. And I am going to be a student in the LLC PhD in the fall. <laughs> you want to go, Andrew? I'm Andrew Dolan. I also teach history at Shady Grove for UMBC. All right. And I see one of my students just popped on. Hooray, Lee, we're just yeah. saying hi and getting started. <laughs> you want to introduce <laughs> yourself? No worries if you don't want to turn your camera on. It's not required. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I didn't realize how informal this would be. <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Where did I? Hello. Um, my <laughs> name is Lee Robertson. I'm a, um, a history major and a public history minor at UMBC, Shady Grove. And, um, and I'm in Dr. Blair's uh, public history class helping with um, uh, preserving Pleasant View. So, awesome. Yeah, it's Everybody wonderful. Good to see you. Yeah, <laughs> good to see you too. All right. Well, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a few images of our collaboration. Um, everyone can see that now, the PowerPoints? Yes, it's, it, it looks like uh, I'm sharing my screen correctly. Um, but but really, uh, this is a conversation. Um, we'll, uh, Jerry and I have some questions for each other about what it's been like to uh, partner on these projects. Um, and that's the main heart of what we want to do with our 50 minutes here is, uh, is have a conversation. Um, and so don't worry, we're not going to be in 50 minutes of PowerPoint slides, but it is useful, uh, you know, so, you know, more than half of us are familiar and, uh, uh, um, but not everybody is. So let's let her, let's introduce you to the site. Um, Pleasant View Historic Site is in Montgomery County. And you may know that um, at the Universities of Shady Grove, UMBC runs a history program there. We also offer a public history minor, and that's something that I've been doing for the last eight years, uh, is working uh, with our public history students. And these two places, Universities of Shady Grove and Pleasant View, are about 10 minutes apart driving time. Uh, and so I want to go back to where it started, which is with Jerry's son, who's pictured here, um, Jason Green. Um, in my very first semester at uh, UMBC, I had been a practitioner for uh, in historic preservation for kind of a long time before uh, becoming uh, a professor and, and getting involved in teaching public history. So, you know, honestly, my first semester, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, literally, I'd never taught in the classroom. I had ideas having been trained as a public historian of what I thought good public history teaching looked like, but I had never done it. And um, totally overwhelmed. <laughs> Andrew was there mentoring me, um, but I got an email from Jason and had said, hey, I hear you're new to UMBC at Shady Grove. Um, I hear you're a public historian and I want to tell you about a very special place. And, and like I said, I was overwhelmed and um, I think I kind of blew him off. <laughs> A couple of weeks and finally, you know, oh, okay, let me respond, get back, let's meet. Jason came to my office at uh, Shady Grove campus, walked in the door and basically just blew my mind with the story of this place, with his family journey, with his own personal journey. Um, and in that meeting, as he introduced me to the history of this incredible uh, community, he basically said, do you want to go see it? Yeah. It's like right now. So we got in Jason's car and drove over to the site, and here it is. It is uh, founded in 1868. There is a uh, two-room schoolhouse, um, a church, and a cemetery. And what you can see from the image is that it's surrounded by modern um, suburbanization. Jason was in the middle of a journey to create, uh, to to learn more about his uh, his ancestor's story, his family story, the story of this place, and he was. Uh, uh, 
in the process of creating a documentary. And if uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I urge you to, uh, it's streaming on MPT. It was shown nationally over the last uh, few months uh, across PBS, PBS stations around the country. And it's just an incredible story that I can't do justice to um, in this short time. Um, so this is the schoolhouse, and 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 this is not how it looks today. It's under a major renovation. Uh, this is what it looked like when Jason first brought me here, and um, this is what it looks like. It looked like inside. We stepped into the schoolhouse and the old potbelly stove, the little desks. Um, it literally felt like stepping back in time and into something very very important. Um, and so uh, this is the interior of that church. Um, and uh, again, just to give you a little sense of what this place um, uh, looked like before now, which is the buildings are literally being opened up and uh, renovated uh, so that they can stand for another 150 years, we, uh, we hope and pray. Um, and so, again, uh, sort of stumbling through the process of trying to figure out uh, how to be a public history educator, and bring students into the process. Um, we uh, we partnered again and again over multiple semesters. And so the same partnership working on the same site, but doing different projects with each student group. And so just very briefly uh, to give you a sense of what that looked like over the years, um, the very first group we did a feasibility study where we sort of were exploring best practices in public history and envisioning uh, possibilities for the site. Um, another group worked on an exhibit. Uh, they created panels and we put those up at our library at University of Shady Grove. And I think uh, they're in storage somewhere, but they, they've been on display at the Pleasant View site as well. Uh, another group worked on a survey of the cemetery and actually the group that's working uh, this spring is doing some work to update and uh, digitize uh, some of that work. So just to kind of give you a sense of uh, that that um, idea of like, we're going to do something uh, slightly different each time, but we're, but it's the same partnership. Um, uh, what the students are doing this semester, I'm going to like not spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, the students this year are working on sort of a deep dive into uh, all of the uh, archival resources that are available online. So historic maps, uh, land records, census records through Ancestry.com, um, and hopefully we'll even be getting into agricultural census uh, data, which is my favorite thing. Um, it, it, you know, at the beginning of this semester, I'll say, right, um, Omicron was uh, in full rage while I was planning this, and I thought, you know, we don't know what this semester is going to look like, so how can we um, make use of um, uh, online resources, and who knows uh, what kind of access we'll have to physically be at, at the site, and, and, um, and ha happily, we've been able to to get out and and um, be in person and on the ground. Um, and so, just uh, the down in the bottom left is uh, from a few iterations back, uh, students um, doing mock-ups of what maybe interpretive panels or signs might look like in the uh, in the restored building someday to help uh, tell the story of this uh, community. Um, and and. Jerry, we've got we've got some amazing finds that <laughs> again I can't wait to tell you about um, in the work that the students have been doing um, this semester. But I'm going to let them tell you, um, oh, and, not, and not today. <laughs> looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Um, and so I, I just just a few more thoughts from me before we go into more of a dialogue is um, is that when I've been able to you know to to be welcomed in and to be a part of a living history, a living community. Um, I always have this sort of altruistic sense of being handed something precious. And it, with that um, gift, the gift of being invited into this world is, is a sense of responsibility uh, and a desire to um, do good work that I think probably bonds all of us, right? Uh, everybody working in public humanities, but even beyond that, right? We want, we want to do, um, we want to make a difference. We want to do uh, things that are meaningful. And so as, uh, you know, for instance, as uh, trustees and other community members, uh, uh, meeting them over the years, hearing their stories, uh, for example, what it's like, what it was like to attend a segregated school. Um, it, it just has 
personally for me been a very transformative experience. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the student experience. And again, Lee, thank you for being here. You could talk about how this is happening at right now, <laughs> maybe in our Q and A time. Um, but you just, we just don't know where it's going to go. So, along with uh, the coursework, a number, uh, not a huge number, but several students have also interned. Um, and so, Taylor here that we're showing um, did an internship through partnership with uh, Heritage Montgomery, the Maryland State Archives. Uh, working on uh, creating an archive uh, for the Pleasant View site. And so community members shared their photo albums, their documents. Uh, they were all boxed up with archival material taken down to the archives and Taylor spent the summer um, scanning that. Uh, Lee, I think that will resonate with you <laughs> from a different project. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, Taylor was a student who was thinking about a career in public history and particularly in archives. and. You know, she spent the summer there and and crushed it, right? The, the, the archivists, her supervisors reported back, they couldn't believe what she got done in one summer and how good she was at it. But she also decided she didn't want to be an archivist. And that is fine. <laughs> uh, you know, she's gone on to do other amazing things. And so the experience of bringing students into this work, it's not um, to, to, I've learned to not have a, a set agenda on what the outcome will be for them. Because I can't always predict it. Um, it's going to be rich. I know that much. Um, and that's enough to, uh, to, to forge ahead. <laughs> um, another thing about bringing students into this work is that the unique people that enroll in the course are going to absolutely shape the way the course turns out and what happens next. Uh, so just another example of that, I have been struck by how um, uh, in particular, students who are uh, first generation college students um, or uh, immigrants to this country, um, how when they come to the Pleasant View site, they click in like you can't, it's, it's incredible. So I'm uh, Eric here on the far, uh, seated in the folding chair on the right, uh, grew up in Guatemala. And for him, when he walked onto this uh, site where there's this small church, he's, you know, sort of humble architecture, but it, he, he immediately knew from his home experience in, in uh, you know, of what it means to have this place that is your everything that shapes your whole, uh, uh, your whole life. And, and you spend so much time there and it's, every, you know, and just, so, so he didn't need hours and hours of background reading and, and to be an expert in the history of African American life in Montgomery County, like just uh, to be able to connect. And then when, um, you know, to sit down and to talk to someone, uh, Melvin Joppe, who's shown here, who's just a, a trustee and an incredible human being, uh, to watch that open up of say, I get this. Um, and and it relates to the, the current experience of, um, you know, I grew up in a society that denied me opportunities that discriminated against me. And now you're living uh, a, a, a 21st century version of that. Uh, and, and, uh, and so for me, just to, to see that those connections and um, frankly, to get out of the way. And I remember this day, we literally packed up all the rest of us. <laughs> and Eric and uh, Wilson and Melvin just kept talking, uh, which, is, which is the point, right? Um, and so just one last image before we uh, um, uh, just uh, hear more from Jerry. Pre-COVID, post-COVID. <laughs> uh, on the left there, it, I see this, just the happiness and joy of a whole group of students um, in and around the Pleasant View site. There we are just so casually, uh, so close to each other with no masks. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, like I said, not always knowing, like, what were the possibilities for doing this work in a, in a world that's transforming uh, from before our very eyes. And so just the gratitude, um, you can see uh, this is this year's class um, out meeting with Jason and Jerry. Um, we're masks, but we're, we're, we're there and, and we couldn't be happier to, to be there and to have the chance to um, do field work 
to connect with others. Um, it's just deeply meaningful. Also in this photo, I hope you can see how um, how the, the schoolhouse is uh, undergoing this uh, really massive <laughs> restoration um, that's, that's just super excited to see. And somebody's starting to um, uh, mow outside the lawn, outside the window. So I hope my sound's okay. Let me know if not. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen and um, and I'm going to flip to uh, some questions uh, for you, Jerry, if you're ready. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Give me just a minute. All right, so I'd like to start with your own um, a little bit of your own life history and your relationship with this site. Um, could you tell us uh, uh, sort of your journey with growing up in a place like uh, Quince Orchard? And I know that's a big story. <laughs> yes, it is a big story. But first of all, I'd like to thank you for what you've shared uh, in terms of the engagement with UMBC and the public history. Um, it's good to know the backstory in terms of how uh, you were engaged and how Jason uh, played a role in, in that happening. Um, for me, uh, Quince Orchard is home. It's where I grew up. Uh, I'm a fourth generation green living in Quince Orchard, Maryland. Jason is part of the fifth generation. And as we look back, I guess you need to understand that uh, in our looking back, we've come to understand that uh, my paternal grandfather, uh, Gary Green, and um, his wife were actually enslaved in uh, Quince Orchard and in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and they were owned by um, the Higgins family, who were siblings, uh, one who owned land in Rockville, the other who owned land in uh, Darnstown. Um, and so, as we look back over the documents in terms of their enslavement, uh, it was for life. Fortunately, the Civil War happened, the Emancipation Proclamation happened, and in 1865, uh, they were freed. And in 1868, um, the Greens decided not to leave the area. They decided to plant roots in the community. And part of the roots that they planted in the community were around uh, a three acre site that's now known as the Pleasant View Historic Site. Uh, on that site is a church, which you've seen a picture of, and also a schoolhouse. Um, the Green family was very much invested in the community, invested in that church and that school. As a matter of fact, uh, my mother, who is now 103, was a student at the Queen Orchard School. Uh, in the pictures that Melissa showed, uh, there was a picture of her brother, who is now 98, who was a student in the school. Many of the trustees of the Pleasant View Historic Site were students at uh, the Queen Orchard, uh, Orchard Colored School, but were also members of the Pleasant View Methodist Episcopal Church. And so those the school, the church, were the hub of the community uh, of Quince Orchard. Um, and it, for me, I'm a pastor. My call to ministry took place in that Pleasant View uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, growing up, uh, that site was the, um, the church and the schoolhouse were the hub of the community. Um, but also understand that in terms of my growth and growing up, for the first oh, 12, 13 years of my life, we were living in a segregated community. Okay, so um, we were going to black schools and white schools and, uh, and and things of that sort. And so, for me, that site is sacred space uh, because that's where I was formed as in some ways as a human being, and. In my mind, it's also too precious in the sense to lose. So that that's a little bit in terms of, of, of the history in terms of the Green family within that community. But what I shared in terms of the Green family is also representative of what was happening in terms of many of the other African American families within that Queen Soldier community. The, uh, interesting story that, that Jason shares in terms of his engagement with my mother when she was uh, hospitalized and there was some concern about her not making it out. So he was engaging with her and having conversation around um, where she grew up. And he asked her where she grew up and she said she grew up in Quince Orchard. And he said, no, you grew up along Quince Orchard Road. 
And she said, no, I grew up in the Queen's Orchard community. And he did not challenge her related to that. But he did do some research and he went back and he looked in some of the papers. I believe one was the Washington Post and he discovered that indeed, Quince Orchard was a community. It wasn't just the name of a road, just not just the name of a, of a high school. And so he then found out that uh, that community was known for its churches, three churches in particular. One was Pleasant View Methodist Episcopal. The other was McDonald Chapel, which was a white Southern congregation, and also Hunting Hill, which, which was a Northern uh, Methodist church. Now, all three of those churches had split over the issue of slavery back in the early 1800s. Have I spoken enough at this point, Melissa, about uh, connectedness? <laughs> we in terms love of hearing <laughs> you. I'm never going to cut you off, Jerry. <laughs> But, Keep going. But, Keep going. Okay, but but a, a significant event related to those three churches happened uh, April fourth, nineteen sixty eight. So you have three congregations that are operating independently of one another, divided by race, and yet each of those three congregations were struggling in terms of what are we going to do in terms of our future, because the demographics of the community were changing. Okay, uh, each was struggling financially. And so the, the conversation evolved around what would happen if we were to come together, okay, and form one particular church as opposed to having three different congregations. Um, and so that conversation continued. And I recall as a 17 year old, uh, April 4th, 1968, that our particular congregation, Pleasant View Methodist Episcopal, had gathered and were having conversations about whether or not to um, to merge with these other two congregations. And that conversation become rather heated because you have to understand that parts of my family and other families were vested in that church. They had put up money to provide for the land to purchase that particular congregation. And there was uncertainty about what would happen as a result of going in with those two white congregations. It, what would happen if it would not work? And in some ways, there was a schism that took place even within my own family related to whether or not that merger should happen. And so as we're engaging in conversation, the pastor comes and knocks on the door the pastor happened to be white because he had been appointed to all three of those congregations and shared with us the information, the news that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. And you can imagine what happened in terms of the black congregation gathered in that room that all of a sudden we were silent and there were, there were tears. And Reverend Horton, who was white, pulled us together and we entered into a time of prayer. Being a little innocent 17 year old, I wanted to know what was going on. And so I watched, I kept my eyes open. And I watched to see what happened, what Reverend Horton was doing. And as I watched him, there was a tear that was trickling down his cheek. And those tears symbolized to me that here was this white person paying for this black pastor. And in that, that said to me that Dr. King's life and death wasn't just about securing of rights for African Americans. It was about human rights. It was about people being able to come together. As a result of the assassination, that meeting broke up. But in September of that year, those three congregations came together. And in coming together, they were, in a sense, living into the dream of Dr. King. They were creating something new and different. Because you see, in 1968, things were very tumultuous. There were riots that were taking place. There were things that were happening as a result of Dr. King's death. What those three congregations decided to do was to create a new and different future and to live into the dream of the beloved community. That coming together, to my mind, is significant in terms of the story that needs to be communicated to folk today because we're also living in those turbulent times and they need to have information, historical information that says there's a different way to go forward. That yes, there can be division, there can be divisiveness, but people have to intentionally decide 
that they're going to create a new and different future. And an example of that is what took place at the Pleasant View Historic Site. And so we're in the process now of, of telling that story. And the partnership with UMBC and the public history class is, is so vital because it allows the trustees to, to share their story, but also it invites students to come in to see how precious that site is. And then they become part of the history, they become part of the story. Um, I think I have said enough at this point. <laughs> it's, thank you, thank you. Sure. Um, I, I, I titled this session, Doers Do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, two-part question, what's Doers Do? And second one, could you uh, shift over and tell us a little bit more about uh, your role as a trustee and the, the hard work of preserving this site? Surely, doers do. So, our son Jason uh, asked his grandmother, you know, when he talks in terms of Pleasant View, the, the church and the schoolhouse, uh, it's if you drive past the site, it's right along the main thoroughfare. And he asked the question of, of his, his grandmother. So, of all the places, why is it that they chose to put to locate the church uh, there? And his grandmother said to him, your great, great grandfather realized that there was a need within the community for a church and for a school and that your grandfather was a doer and doers do. And so he came together with other people within the community and they did what was necessary in order to create a place for education and development in terms of faith for the African-American community. And so doers do. I believe he even created a little band to put around his wrist that say doers do. And so the, the students who are involved in the public history class are doers. They are engaging that community in a loving way. Uh, the trustees are engaging the students in a loving way. And together we are doing what's necessary to not only preserve the history of that site, but to help people understand that it's a living history. That it's not just a matter of coming and visiting the buildings. It's coming to, to get a sense of the walls are speaking to the people and you get to come and you get to engage the trustees and find out about their story. Uh, and they're not just uh, interviews, they become friends, they become part of the Pleasant View story. I'm sorry, I, I haven't addressed the second part of your question. Sure, just tell us a little of the challenges. I mean, honestly, this is work that's been going on for decades to preserve the site. Um, I, I, you know, we could we could we could say the work's been going on since 1868, but certainly in earnest in 68 when it when it's transitioned from the, the main church home to a, a historic site. Sure. Um, Tell us just a little bit about that journey of, of working for so long to uh, to see these buildings uh, and, and the history uh, preserved and also, um, you know, what it's like to see the renovations underway right now. Absolutely. And so what I shared with you about that conversation that took place in, in terms of 68 and the merger of those congregations, part of the, the conversation was around what is it that we're going to lose in the sense that because we're so vested in the property that if we were to go fully in that we might lose that. Um, and so uh, when that merger took place, the other two churches actually sold their properties. McDonald Chapel, where that was at one time, there's now bank. <laughs> where uh, Hunting Hill was located, there is now a uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So of the three sites, the only one that's still in existence is the Pleasant View Historic Site. Um, and so that was deeded over to the, the trustees of Pleasant View. And since 1968, the trustees have had responsibility for maintenance of that site. And so the trustees have, have essentially been digging into their own pockets to maintain it. Um, you become kind of protective of a site that is so sacred and so precious to you, and you become somewhat insular and you're protecting it. And so what has had to happen over the years, and I dare say as a result of the partnership with uh, the public history class in UMBC, is that 
the doors have been opened. And now the trustees are willing to, to share the stories. They're willing to invite people to come in uh, to find out about the history, but also to create a different sense of community. That this is not just something that belongs to the trustees. It's something that belongs to the, the Quince Orchard community. And the Quince Orchard community is a diverse community. It's a community that has reconciled. It's a community that has come together. And so the trustees see the need in order to do that. And as a result, uh, the relationship with the public history class is allowing that to take place. Uh, it's been a struggle over the last however many years in terms of maintaining the site. But we've received some grants from the Maryland Historic Trust. We received a bond bill that's allowing us to renovate the, the schoolhouse. Uh, there, were, there were actually three buildings as part of the schoolhouse. Uh, there was the original uh, one room schoolhouse, which my mom and her brother attended, which was moved from across the road. Uh, that has been brought back to uh, bare bones. I was down there this morning just before this, and they have now uh, put in a new foundation uh, and they're beginning to uh, restore the walls and things of that sort. But it was interesting just watching as the peeling was taking place and the different layers were there to see the different generations that were part of that school. Um, and so it for the trustees, it's we understand the gift that has been given to us. The sacrifice that um, our predecessors made in order to purchase that land. And the gift that's given to us that we need to preserve it, the generations that are to come, but also need to be willing to tell the entire story, the full story, and realizing that we can't do that alone, that we need to invite the community in to help preserve it, but also to tell the story. And Lee is a very important part of telling that story. Her willingness to engage the community, her willingness to, to share her knowledge, her gifts and talents to help tell that story. And, and, and that's so vitally important to us. Well, that kind of leads right into my next question for you is, um, and, and then I'll stop and you can ask me a question or two and, and everybody can ask questions. But um, so I think it's probably obvious to everybody here what a, what a gift it's been for UMBC to be invited into this. And you've talked a little bit about the, some of the benefits, what the benefits are to Pleasant View, right? To engaging the broader community, inviting other people into the um, story. Um, you know, can you think of any of the drawbacks of what it's, you know, of partnering with it, with an institution, with a university? I, I have to be honest and say that in terms of the partnership that has taken place thus far, I don't see anything negative that has come out of that. <laughs> You're so nice. <laughs> well, no, no. I, or just blessing, okay, maybe not negative. Well, I guess but, the, the blessing but, you know, has it's been... not easy work, right? Like it's not easy work. So mm -hmm. so maybe it's not. I'm not asking you for dirt. <laughs> <laughs> just just perhaps like it's it it's not easy to partner with with others and 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 so perhaps what are some of the challenges that are you know the sort of like how is that. Does that reframe it a little bit? Well, uh, maybe I guess maybe a challenge would be in terms of just in terms of being able to communicate clearly what it the desires and what the needs are in terms of the trustees, in terms of the site, um, and how to frame that in such a way that it can be accomplished as each class comes along, because each class has a a time frame in which they need to work. And sometimes the projects that, that need to be addressed cover several different classes, okay? The other challenge is that our trustees are older. I said my mom's 103, her brother's 95, uh, and 80. I won't tell you how old I am, but I think <laughs> the youngest trustee is probably in their 60s, 50s, 60s. 
And so we need to have uh, additional trustees to, to come in. Um, and so part of the challenge is their availability to have be interviewed and to have those conversations. COVID did not help in that process. Uh, they become fairly adept now in terms of Zoom because that's how we meet as, as, as trustees. Um, but it just, it, it's been a wonderful partnership. Um, probably the challenge has been in terms of the availability of the trustees to meet with the students and just in terms of their ability to, to navigate getting back and forth and things of that sort. Um, it's not a challenge, but I think being able to tell the whole story, uh, being able to tell the story from different perspectives, and I think that's what the students bring. Um, yeah. Well, I will uh, give you a chance to ask me some things, and and uh, in, at, in about five minutes, then we'll uh, let others. Uh, Jean is already weighing in with some some really <laughs> great great questions, and okay. uh, just to connect you and Gina is a I. We I'm so happy we're all here. <laughs> so, so, what would you like to ask me? <laughs> so, okay. So, I'm thinking back to that initial conversation that that you had with Jason, and perhaps some reluctance in terms of that initial engagement. But, so I guess my question would be, how has your work benefited from uh, the partnering that's taken place with Pleasant View? Well, for one, I mean, I. I just feel like I got so incredibly lucky on so many levels, mm -hmm. right? Um, to be able to teach uh, public history and to have a such a deeply meaningful site just 10 minutes away from our campus, like, right, just logistically amazing. Um, two, to be brought into such a, a gracious and loving and caring, thoughtful group of people who are, um, who are willing to let me make mistakes and learn and and willing to let students right like we don't know what we're doing not you know i, I mean i'm supposed to i'm the expert right <laughs> whatever you know we're we're figuring it out as we go to try to fail you know um it, this is such a golden opportunity for for me as an educator and for them as learners and so i think we just couldn't i just can't imagine a more um uh, accepting and, and great group to, to work with. So that's just been beyond uh, a blessing. I can't even fully articulate how deep that goes, but I think too, like I am a, a, a scholar with a, with a desire to be an active uh, researcher and writer. And so it's been exciting in these last few years where honestly, at first it was hard because I felt like well, this is pulling me in a different direction and I'm also trying to do this thing. Um, I work on farm buildings in Maryland. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to write a book about farming in Maryland. And um, it's just been the last couple of years where finally the, uh, the public history teaching and work has uh, started to, um, and, my, and my research interest over here has started to come together in a beautiful way because your ancestors were farming people. <laughs> Yes, and so so now my my book project is becoming deeply uh, much richer, and to be able to write the history of people who I know their descendants, I can't tell you how cool that is. <laughs> um, you know, to 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 be able, it just it's just a, a overall very 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 um, like I said layered and rich experience. So I'm going to actually let let the the group get in on it now because we only have 10 minutes left. So okay. so Gina, you put a number of questions in the in the chat already. Can can you just go ahead and unmute and and uh and ask or yeah. share whatever you'd like to share? Sure. That and the ones on my my notes. I'm just going. This is amazing. <laughs> um let me see. Um, so, first of all, I'll couch it with saying I did attend the viewing that Jason had of the documentary, mm -hmm. um, which was outstanding. Um, so, I'm just going to read through both questions. They're in the chat, though. What are some of the things researchers should consider when they are trying to create relationships and develop trust with communities? 
That's the first one. And then the second is, has the relationship with UMBC advanced the efforts on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the descendant community to do the work of preservation, conservation, and telling the story? Great. I'll, I'll take the first one, Jerry, if you want to take the second. <laughs> right. You know, we're, we're trying to create a community of, 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 of scholars and students and uh, community partners uh, that are dedicated to uh, not being extractive. And right. And <laughs> we can't just come in like outside experts land in a community, have our classes run away. <laughs> right. And I am not, um, this is a process. I am not doing this perfectly at all. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, my one recommendation is to, when you form your community partnerships to perhaps think about the idea of, of sticking, starting small and sticking with one group and staying with them for a longer time, because it's only after a couple of years that I felt like, oh, we're finally giving back. <laughs> You know, and, and it is constraining to try to fit this in the context of our, our academic schedules. Like we have a course, we have the beginning, middle, end of course, we've got to give grades to the students, right? This skews the work in ways that are uh, not always comfortable for me, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a lot of great advice other than to say that, um, you know, if your intentions are true and, and grounded and you can build that trust with your partners and um, make a commitment, I would say too, I, you obviously see that I got super lucky this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, what would it look like by was, you know, if, if Jason hadn't just showed up on my door, <laughs> um, I, I think the, the reverse of making a commitment is that if you, if you were to start a partnership, and you found that your own research and teaching needs weren't aligned uh, or, or what that community wanted to go where they wanted to go and what they wanted to achieve, to achieve is to is to is to say hey that didn't work thanks for the opportunity and and move on right i don't know that's i'll stop there um jerry did you want to handle this Second question, uh, has the relationship with the UMBC advanced the efforts on behalf of the trustees and descendant community to do the work of preservation, conservation, and telling the story? Short answer is yes. <laughs> Give me the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a short answer. Okay. And part of, of being able to tell that story is based upon building a trusting relationship. Okay. Um, and as as you as Melissa shared in the pictures, uh, the time spent sitting around with some of the trustees engaging in conversation, getting to know um, one another, develops a relationship in which a person is willing to share more in terms of, of that relationship. And then their op the openness happens and there's a willingness to trust that this particular class will accurately depict the story, will share um, to the broader community why this particular site is so sacred. And so it's not something that just happens overnight. It, it happens as a result of perhaps multiple classes uh, becoming part of it. It happens as a result of, 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 of a professor who's willing to invest the time and the energy to get to know the people, um, who's willing to write letters of recommendation when, when folk are applying for loans, which then lets people understand that, no, this is not just uh, about a, a class. This is about um, an investment in a sacred space and a willingness to help promote it and to bring it uh, and help communicate to the broader community what it's about. Um, and that I think that's the relationship that we have with it, with, with Lissa and, and her students, that um, we trust that they're going to help us accurately depict the story. 
and its meaningfulness, not just to the trustees, but to the broader community. And that didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, and I just want to kind of add on this and I'm going to try to hold it together, but, um, it's okay. I can't, <laughs> it, you don't know where it's going to go. And so right. being, being comfortable with that. And so I'm going to just share one quick story of Colin. All right. Colin was a psych student at UMBC who just happened to get into public history, which we're all so grateful that he did. And Colin came into the class and that rolled into an internship with the Quince Orchard Project and Jason. And um, and that in that funding from that internship allowed Colin to purchase um, health insurance through Obamacare. And Colin was a couple about a year after his internship was in a horrific car accident and uh, on 95 and had taken to shock trauma in, in Baltimore. And we did not think he would live. And it was weeks of just waiting. Um, and, you know, to, he, he did, you guys, good news, he did. And to be in the, in the rehab hospital with the students who had been in that course with him was like nothing else and to watch him come back and fight for his life and he says that this class saved his life <laughs> mm. so i just want to say like could i ever have predicted something like that um absolutely not and so i i love that i see the relationships that form i see i see people building friendships that they will have for their life i have made friends with the greens and other members of the trustees that are that's changed my life and so i think just opening yourself up to like hey anything can happen here <laughs> listen thank you for sharing that I, I remember that when that happened and getting a call from jason that uh, colin was in in the hospital and then driving over to the hospital and having prayer with colin and meeting his parents there uh which then says that you become part of the family yeah so <laughs> make me cry. Stop. Wow, I know. We're 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 coming down the wire on our time, and I know where this is a keep the time event. Um, so you know, uh, I don't know how to how to wrap it up other than to thank everybody for coming. And and Jerry, I I know if, if those uh, others that are here, and and I would just say particularly Gina, we got to connect because Gina's doing some work that is so yeah. deeply related to this. Um, so, um, maybe I'll just end with thanking everybody for coming and thanking, uh, you, Jerry, for sharing, um, any last, any last thoughts? <laughs> just, if you have the opportunity to create this type of partnership, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it's a blessing. It's a blessing to the trustees. I, I hope, hope it's a blessing to, uh, some listen to students. hundred percent. Thank Thanks you everybody. So yeah, so um, sorry to come in and be the moderator person after that amazing story, but um, I put the Google slides back in the chat so you can decide, uh, if you look at that, you can decide which session you wanna go to next. And in this particular room, you can stay here if you want. It's gonna be a session called Lakeland's Legacy. Um, so if you want to click and see what that's about, you can stay right here, or um, we do have a couple other options actually just two two different options um, for this session. Um, and then uh, just a reminder, if you get a chance to do our evaluation form, uh, let me put that back in the chat for you all for the event. And um, yeah, thank you both so much for such a meaningful session. And um, I liked I liked the intimacy of the of the group. So that was that, that worked really well. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Have a great Thank afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. It was so good to meet you, Dr. Green. Good to meet you. Looking forward to our meeting again. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Take care. In person. In person. Dr. In person. Oh, I'll drive out. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me know when. Let me tag along. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks, Andrew. I see. Okay. Gina, you're you're the moderator for the next session. Yes, I'm the okay. moderator for the next one.
Alrighty. And while you're getting ready for that, Gina, I'll just, um, uh, uh, I don't know, I didn't share his contact information with you earlier. I'll send that to you in an email right now. That'll be great. And I will set up something. Maybe the two of us can go and have lunch with him and oh my. talk and I'm out to the site. <laughs> I mean, that's such a gift. It's such a gift. It really is. I'm, I'm I, not blessed. <laughs> yeah, and I can't wait to tell you, like, just kind of catch you up on what's been going on on my project. And, you know, I'm about to ask for another extension. I was listening to you and I was thinking, it's interesting how people might come to a project in different ways. So this project for you came from the community coming to you. Yeah. Say, hey, you're our girl. Come on. <laughs> how, how, so not typical, right? And then and then you're left looking for funding for things where my project came to me because the funder came and said, we need someone to do this. Right. But I don't really have the community connection. And that it's funny because you're talking about the long-term commitment once you 